Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this webinar on the common SOLIDWORKS tech support issues that we experience here at MCAD. I want to remind you that um, your microphones are muted, so uh, we'll have an opportunity for questions at the end of the session. We will also have a follow-on webinar on the same topic related to simulation tech support issues that will be next month in, in February, so look for that one as well. Hopefully this will uh, give you some good information about these common issues that uh, we cover on our tech support team and help you avoid some of those problems and maybe make your work workflow a little bit easier. So let's get started. Here's our roadmap for the webinar. We'll, uh, like I said, we're going to have time at the end of the session for any additional questions you might have that I could field for you. So let's talk first about some support statistics. Here's a graphic that shows the categories and the relative uh, number of support cases that we cover. As you see, the majority is related to problem areas, and these include things like uh, installation issues, software bugs affecting the use of the software, uh, activation counts, maybe exceeding limits, simulation error messages, things like that. Uh, How-to issues come up in about a quarter of the cases that we take. And these are like mini tutorial sessions where we give instruction for things like feature use or installation procedures or maybe simulation setup. Uh, training. So uh, we, we try to keep those how-to issues fairly brief since we have uh, the training at our offices. But we do like to help out if you get stuck and you need help uh, moving along. Other areas, the other problem area or the other area listed there in the graph includes things like requests for listing of company assets to sort out licensing, uh, requests for exemption files, uh, maybe discussions about computer system requirements when someone is wanting to uh, upgrade their system and get a new machine that, that uh, runs SOLIDWORKS well. And then the small category there for reach out calls, uh, these, are made, these calls are made by our tech team to current support customers like yourself. It's basically our initiative to contact you guys, uh, especially those who haven't used the services in the last six months, just to make sure that you're uh, getting the most out of the software. And hopefully this increases the value for the customers. I should mention uh, as we go along here, if you have any questions along the way, feel free to enter those in the questions category in the webinar interface. And I'll be keeping an eye on those, and we can address those either as we go along or at the end of the session here. So um, let's talk about some of the real numbers real quick. Um, we have uh, 18 techs here at MCAT. And these are, uh, they're all tech support engineers, and, and we also teach classes at the offices or give demonstrations to new and existing customers. Uh, this number also includes four of us who are managers. Uh, first, a quick poll for you. Um, how many cases do you think uh, we field uh, each month here at MCAT? I'm going to send a poll your way here about that. So you should see that. There's an open poll, if you wouldn't mind. Picking one, one of the answers there for wh how many cases you think uh, MCAD handles each month. OK, thank you for responding. Those are coming in now. Great, it looks like uh, most of you have voted. And uh, so I'll close the poll. And the results show that most of you think that the uh, number of cases on a monthly basis is between five and 600. And um, the actual number is about 650 cases monthly. And that translates to about 7,800 cases yearly. So as you can see, we handle a lot of uh, tech support inquiries each year. And uh, it's, it's a good thing that uh, you know, our customers are making good use of the, of the subscription services, and we do uh, we do appreciate that, and we appreciate you guys buying that service and making good use of it. OK, so let's move on to probably the more, more common areas um, related to uh, our tech support inquiries, and that's the installation and licensing. 
a uh, few of those few of the topics that I'm going to talk about are listed here. So uh, basically, applying upgrades or updates um, issues if those don't don't go right, uh, and then I'll talk about uh, network installations and uh, how we can download the whole DVD. So first, uh, in general, uh, this for service up update service pack updates. Um, the uh, the best way to handle that, based on our experience, is really related to is is going to be using the uh, check for updates feature. That's within SolidWorks. You can start this from the help pull down menu. There's a check for updates under there. That will open the appropriate uh, service pack. I'm sorry, the for appropriate installation manager for the service pack you're running. So, for instance, if you're on uh, the SP1 release but you originally installed with the SP0 release, uh, doing this technique from, from the help pull-down menu will start the SP1 installation manager and then go out and check for the updates that are going to be appropriate for your installation. And then in terms of major release upgrades, what we have found uh, works best is if you have, um, for if you first uninstall the old program unless you're going to do a side-by-side -side installation and that's perfectly acceptable um, but if you do and if you're going to just stay with the current major release go ahead and uninstall the old through the Windows control panel and then install the new and now an uh, important note is that if you're uninstalling and you're not going to reinstall on this machine you're going to maybe move it to a different machine uninstalling does not remove the activation so if you don't first use the transfer license from the help pull down menu, that, that activation will get hung up on that, that old machine. And it won't be accessible for the, for the other machine that uh, you're, you're going to try to put it on. So some important steps there, just depending on uh, what you're going to do with it uh, when, you, when you uninstall. Now, as I mentioned, it's, it's OK to go ahead and have side-by-side -side installations of a couple of major releases. And if you do that, uh, what I recommend is to go ahead and generate a, a new folder for the new release. So Sol SolidWorks Installation Manager will use the uh, SolidWorks Corp generic uh, file name or folder name. And so you could, you could append that. You could create a new folder called the SolidWorks Corp 2015, for example, and direct the Installation Manager to go there as opposed to putting numbered folders underneath the SolidWorks Corp folder. All right, another quick poll for you, my last one. Basically, I'm going to launch that poll. SolidWorks installations sometimes fail. You'll see a poll there for that. <laughs> Let's see, a lot of yeses coming in. Yes, a lot of yeses. OK, great. Looks like it's about a 70% yes, 30% no. So that's uh, a little bit surprising. Uh, so. The, the answer, and it's also encouraging, but the answer is that, yes, they do sometimes fail. Um, the SolidWorks installations uh, are, are going on to totally different machines at each instance. So all PCs are different, are different and um, there are sometimes issues that come up, and I'll speak about that here right up to this slide. But if you're ever asked for the um, installation log files, if you do have problems with an installation, and you're asked for that by the tech support engineer, um, and, it, and it wasn't saved during the process of, of the installation as a result of the prompt for it, you can navigate to the folder shown here to go grab it. So even if you just get through with the installation manager, you cancel out of everything, and you've got the failed installation on your hands, it is possible to go and dig up those logs, those log files. So there's the location for that. Uh, one note about the location is that uh, the, the app data folder, this is typically a hidden folder within Windows, so you might have to go in there and, and uh, show all your folders. And one of the common area, one of the common causes of the failure is a problem with these prerequisite Microsoft programs. So on the right, I show a list of the, the control panel programs and features listing. And so I've highlighted uh, the first one that's very important to SolidWorks is this Microsoft.NET framework. 
that one can sometimes have some issues depending on uh, how things were installed on the system. Another grouping down, down low there is related to this Microsoft C++ program. It uh, is another prerequisite. And then below that, you'll see the Microsoft Visual Studio tools and the remote debugger. So those are typically the common ones. If the failure, if failure is related to the prerequisite programs, that's typically the, the common set of ones that we have to sometimes reinstall manually. And uh, the log files help us pinpoint these and give us good information about which one or which ones to target. So if we do have to reinstall those, uh, those are found within the, the DVD or the download folder for your installation files. So here's a screenshot of that. So under your, typically under your doc, on your documents folder, there's a SolidWorks downloads folder. And with it, within that, there's the everything that you've downloaded related to installing SolidWorks. And then within that folder, there's one called Prerex. The uh, Prerex folder contains several subfolders that have the executables for these, these prerequisites that might need to be re reinstalled. And then um, this kind of points toward, towards those folders, so the .NET F FX and the remote debugger and the VCR EDIST, those folders are related to those redistributables. Now when you install from scratch on a brand new machine, these, these prereq folders are used to um, go get those items and put those on your machine. So these programs will appear within your programs and features for a new installation. And like I say, they are required uh, for SOLIDWORKS to run. Very briefly, if you're running a network license, um, and those are typically denoted by a, the a one in the third character in the serial number, so a 001 or a 901, that designates that you're running a network license. And upgrades to those licenses have to be preceded by an upgrade to the net, solid network license manager, as highlighted here under the service products, or I'm sorry, under the server products within the installation manager. So if you have uh, an issue where you upgrade and you're running a network license and you can't obtain a license, this is probably why. And it's usually denoted within the error message that you um, need to upgrade the SOLIDWORKS Solid Network License Manager. That's a pretty simple process, and we can help you guys with that as needed. Once it's uh, upgraded, it is important to, to reactivate it so that it go in, goes and grabs the, the latest versions of the, of the license and makes those available. And then finally, related to um, installations, a very nice feature is to, to use this download only uh, selection within the installation manager when you're installing. That will literally go get all the files that are that would be on a DVD for that service pack. So uh, disks aren't created for every service pack release by SolidWorks. They're, they're not distributed. There are just too many out there, too many that would have to be distributed. But if you want to get the latest version, the entire installation files on a download, you can do that. Once you've done that, that, that information can be put out on a server and used by, by any number of people within the organization to go ahead and uh, make the installation from a download. That eliminates the need for the disk altogether. That's my preferred method of uh, installing and using the program. All right, let's move on. Let's jump into the, the SOLIDWORKS interface and talk about some parts, some some things that we see related to tech support concerning parts. <clears throat> you may have opened uh, one of your part files and seen this, um, basically a missing, missing body here. So a blank graphics area with uh, items in the tree here that show up sort of like this as you hover over features. This indicates that the body itself has been hidden. And really the only way, at least the only way that I know of, how to get, to, to get the body to show up again is to uh, turn on the solid bodies folder if it's not turned on in the tree here. So by default, you'll see the tree that looks like this with no solid bodies folder. 
but what you can do is go in here and right click and go to the hide show tree items and that brings up your system options and uh, this is where you control what's shown within the tree and the way I like to run with it is basically turn the solid bodies to show all the time from automatic switch that over to show so that you always get the folders appearing in the feature manager tree over here so now you'll see that I have uh, both folders and I do have one body under there now this body folder will show up automatically if there's more than one body in it but in this case we only have one so um, it would not have shown me in the tree with that automatic setting so there you have uh, the body that you can hide and show and that usually resolves those instances where the the part does not show up for you related also to the feature manager uh, sometimes you might get an error message about a, uh, a sketch having issues maybe some entities in the sketch are no longer tied to an edge say for example when you change geometry well if it's sometimes difficult to know where that sketch is based on the appearance of the tree here so we have this filter at the top so I can just type in something there and it'll filter out everything else and so if I'm looking for sketch 10 it'll get me right there and I can highlight that and work with it directly here within the tree edit that sketch right here clearing out the uh, sketch filter or I mean the feature manager filter is very simple with the hitting the X there so that allows you to to dig into things into the tree by searching for them let's talk about um, selection methods when you're working with parts sometimes um, it's a little bit of a struggle to, to select things or uh, it's useful to use some of the selection tools to speed the work along so I've turned on this um, if I right click up here I've turned on the selection filter toolbar I leave that on and that one is down here at the bottom part of my screen so if I want to filter edges or faces I have the ability to quickly do that and toggle that filter on and off um, there's also a lot of helpful right click features so if I create a sketch on this in, in face here as you know we can convert entities uh, so with a face selected I can convert those entities to sketch entities automatically all the outside edges I can also offset those entities with the, with the click of a button here another useful uh, way that you can access those edges or other edges in the model is with a right click so I will uh, right click on an edge here and there's a, a very handy one for me <coughs> is a select tangency that grabs that whole loop of edges all the way around <coughs> another one that's that's very uh, very nice to use um, I'm going to exit out of this sketch is if you're working with um, with entities and say you wanted to work with the edges along this face right here um, I can use my um, select loop tool and you can see how it selected that that closed loop around that that profile of that face the yellow uh, arrow here allows me to toggle it to other possible loops so there it has toggled over to a different set one of the uh, underused tools that I've noticed in tech support is related to the select other functionality and it's it's pretty clever the way they've designed it so say I wanted to select I was in an operation and I wanted to select this face back here but I didn't want to manipulate the model like I've just done if I wanted to to get to that face in another operation I could simply right click on a face above it and then use the select other tool and if you'll notice what it does is it literally takes that face out of the picture that I right clicked on so putting it back sort of in the same orientation um, as you continue to right click on in the model it will remove faces you can also now that this face is visible here to me I can left click on it so I'm hovering over it and a left click would actually select it you also have the ability to select any of the faces that were below my pointer through this this window here so there's the face of interest that's listed in the window so as I go through here you'll see other faces that were below my pointer 
So a couple of ways to use the uh, select other functionality. I'll just go ahead and grab that face there from the from the window. So that's handy for doing things like uh, mates within assemblies, or applying loads and reference directions within simulation, and stuff like that. So that's a couple of issues related to that part. I wanted to open up another one. Let's see. Let's go over to the sheet metal part. One of the common areas related to sheet metal that we get is the struggling to handle the flat pattern. So um, if you notice in this part, this just has a default configuration. And in my sheet metal command manager, I have the ability to flatten it with one click here. And basically what this does is it unsuppresses this flat pattern feature here in the tree. Now the same thing can be accomplished with suppressing and unsuppressing it. So I can do the same thing here as I can with this button. Now when you go, when you move over into creating drawings from your sheet metal parts, there again, notice the single configuration that exists here. And if I create a new drawing from this, and I bring the flat pattern into that drawing, drag and drop that flat pattern in there. I get the appropriate uh, the appropriate bend lines and direction information. Now um, I save this drawing. And then switch back over to my part file. You'll see that it has created within here a derived configuration related to the flat pattern. So working in the drawing with the sheet metal part is when this gets created. Now it can become confusing if you're working with the part again and you, you notice this, now you can start unsuppressing and suppressing or activating, uh, acting th activating this configuration and then uh, going over here and messing with the flat pattern feature when you want to fold it again and unsuppress that. So you can do really you know, whatever you want with this configuration, but it's really reserved for the drawing itself. So uh, you want to leave that unsuppressed in that configuration. And then you want to work with, you want to work in the default configuration when you're viewing uh, the flat pattern when you're working with your part. So just a little trick about, not a trick, but a, a, a pointer about uh, configurations within sheet metal parts when you have drawings created with them. You can get the drawing kind of confused if uh, if you uh, work with that derived configuration and get the suppression of that uh, flat pattern feature in the wrong state. All right, uh, let's jump back over and talk about, I think we covered those, let's talk about assemblies. And um, a couple of items related to working with assemblies that we see that, that can help you on the tech support side. Oops, let me go back there. All right, so um, I've got this uh, gantry assembly that I'm going to open. And it doesn't take very long to open it. It's not that large. You'll notice it loads fairly quickly but it does take some time. So um, one thing that you can do if you're working with very large assemblies, if say you wanted to come in here and make some measurements for the purpose of designing another part, you didn't really want to work with this, uh, but you wanted to make some measurements that would be key to another part, I could come in here and do uh, a different mode of opening this assembly. Within the file open window, you notice we can control things like display states uh, and the mode in which it opens. And you have different levels of, um, of opening the assembly in terms of the overhead. So the very lightest way to open it was, would be this large design review. So I'm going to open it in that and it, it, and it um, giving some information here about 
what you can do in this uh, large design review mode. But you notice it pretty much instantly opens. So it's loading the graphics information uh, related to this assembly. We don't have the feature tree here. But, you know, say I wanted to come in here and say I need to know about the distance that I have, the clearance between, you know, this edge and that face. I can uh, make a measurement there and then move on to my uh, to my design of my other part, knowing this, this distance in here is 40 and a half millimeters. Close the assembly, go work with the, the part directly, uh, and do what I needed to do fairly quickly without worrying about the overhead of opening this. Now in the right-click menu of the feature tree, you know, we can, we can do some things related to getting the full model, set everything to resolve like we would have opened it before, uh, setting everything to lightweight where we have a little more, more body information to work with, and then we can open selected parts within there. I'll just set that to resolved. And there we see the timing, but now we're back to where we started before, where we have all of our features. So make use of the, uh, the file open functionality there to speed things along and not, not cause you to wait a lot on opening something that you don't need to load everything, every part of it for. Okay, uh, the next topic in terms of uh, assemblies, and it really applies to parts, is the use of configurations. I, I mentioned it briefly with that sheet metal part, but let's touch base uh, on it a little bit more. So I have a default configuration here. And if I look at the properties of that configuration, there's some important things about when I create new configurations. So uh, one of the things that we see is that uh, um, a lot of customers have never used configurations. They're a little bit intimidated by them. Uh, and so they're kind of missing out on, on, on leveraging that tool to streamline things for your, your files. So uh, in the properties of this assembly, these advanced options tells the program how to handle this configuration when I create a new configuration and work with it. So any new features that I add to other features and mates that I add to, to other configurations will be suppressed in this one, as well as any new components. So, in, so having known that, knowing that, we're going to create, uh, we're going to add a new configuration here. And so the new configurations inherit those settings from the, the one that was last active. So, so if I want to, um, make a new configuration that has a different uh, uh, actuator size or different components in here. Uh, what I can do, say if I wanted to, to change this uh, linear actuator here in a new configuration and show a smaller size, I could just call, you know, call the uh, configuration the appropriate name, put whatever I need in here in terms of description and comments. And then one important thing about assembly configurations that you can also do is we have this parent child options section down here. So if I know I'm going to create a new configuration and do a new size for that linear actuator, I'll go ahead and check the box for that so that this new configuration that I'm applying to this assembly also gets applied to the part. So I'll go ahead and do that. And you'll notice that um, it's talking about appearances. I'll say yes to that. So we have our small linear actuator assembly configuration. And then if I look at that linear actuator part over in the tree, you'll notice that in the parentheses, it's got that new configuration name there. So I've already automatically uh, set up a new configuration within this uh, linear actuator part. So you can now quickly make your changes to your uh, dimensions on that part. And then uh, let's just go ahead and do that. I'm going to open that. Or actually, I can just drill down and double click on the main feature here. So we'll just grab that. That one is 600. Let's make that 550. And notice I have the configurations that I can choose. And it's set already to change just this configuration. I'm not sure if this is going to blow up any mates, but let's see here. Rebuild. So 
so we have shortened there. And I didn't look co closely at the mates, but that would have to be uh, applied there to correct that. So now when we have the, the two configurations, I can toggle between those. Going back to the 600. All right, so make use of configurations. They're, uh, they're, they're quite useful. Another thing I want to talk about is um, flexible subassemblies. So you'll see in this, uh, this assembly, I have a subassembly that represents this track here for the, uh, for the electrical. And as I move this along, the flexible subassembly lets that update and lay out the way it would in the real, in the real project. One thing to be careful about, um, SolidWorks is working on issues, but there are still some issues related to using a lot of um, flexible sub-assemblies that are, that are embedded within sub-assemblies. So if you get too carried away, away with this, um, you can start getting some issues with the mates. And um, the way this works, if you're not familiar with it, here's uh, the upper one that is not flexible. And if I click on it, I can go to the uh, component properties. And this is where you turn that on and make it flexible right in here in the component properties. So this one's not flexible. This one is. Your little icon shows the difference there. All right, that's flexible subassemblies. Uh, another area of interest that we see is related to colors being uh, appearing differently in assemblies than they are at the component level. So say, for instance, this, um, this plate, this table here, you know, if I open that up, it appears as it does in the, in the assembly. And we have this thing called a display pane that I can show. And so that color is applied at the part level. This uh, satin finish stainless steel appearance gives me this color. Now, back over in the assembly, I, I have the same information here. And these lower triangles indicate where the color is, that the color is applied at the part level. When I make a change to, um, say, if I make a change to this table here under the appearance uh, category, I, you see I get a uh, I get an upper triangle there that shows that I've done that. So I've made that transparent at the assembly level. Uh, same thing, I could edit the appearance of it here. At the assembly level, notice it shows me what's applied at the part level. If I make it at the assembly level, you know, make it red, I get the upper triangle showing me that it's now red at the assembly. It's easy to remove those. Um, uh, those appearances. You can either clear the top level overrides or delete the appearance here. Oops. I can go and delete it from the, the assembly level there. So if you get some crazy looking uh, colors or appearances at the assembly level, go ahead and ex ex um, expose the uh, display pane, show the display pane, and look at these, these uh, triangles here and any transparency settings that might be turned on as well. All right, um, one, uh, one last thing related to assemblies, uh, sharing files, um, looking, where, looking at where files are stored. Uh, first, the, we're looking at where they're stored. You can do the, file, the find references under the file pull down menu. And this shows you a list of where those parts are coming from. Notice I've got some hardware in here that's coming from my, my toolbox library. Everything else from the same folder. So that is the, the reference information. And if I wanted to package these up or save them all out to a new folder, if I wanted to work on a completely different version of this, I can use the pack and go functionality that's also available within the, the Windows Explorer tool. And I can show you that here in a moment. But pack and go allows you to literally collect all the reference files as well as some, the drawings or toolbox components, simulation results. I can save those out to a new folder. I can also save those out to a zip file. I can add uh, changes to the names of the files. You know, if I had a Rev2, I wanted to put on the, the end of the name. 
I could add the uh, suffix for Rev2 there. So it's a, it's a handy utility that allows me to go ahead and uh, gather all the referenced files and uh, either save those out to a new folder or save those to a zip file for archiving. Let's see. This is the right one here. All right, that is our uh, pack and go. Um, before I go to the pack, and the graphics card, I wanted to uh, show you what I just mentioned about the pack and go. Let me bring up uh, Windows Explorer here, and if I go to let's see, documents, I'm going to go to that folder where that um, where I just got that gantry from. If I can remember, let's see. Let me look here and see where it came from. Find references again. Let's see, number 21. This is our what's new, what's new presentation. So 21, here it is. And the gantry. And you notice I can get to the pack and go right from here within the Windows Explorer. So you don't even have to open the file within SolidWorks to make that happen. All right, um, the graphics card. Uh, let's talk briefly about the graphics card. It's important to update your graphics card driver for new releases, or at least to check. And so if you go, to, the easiest way to do that is to open your Windows Start button, go to All Programs, and then uh, SolidWorks, the SolidWorks folder that you're working with. And then under the SolidWorks Tools folder, you'll access this SolidWorks, where is it? SolidWorks RX right there. Um, run SolidWorks RX from the SolidWorks Tools folder. It gets uh, a good amount of system information, which is useful if you have to document a problem, which also this also can be used for for uh, tech support purposes. If you need to document a problem that you're having, you can do that with this tab. So if we ask for a SolidWorks RX, that's what we're, uh, that's what we're asking about. And uh, on the Diagnostics tab, you get information about your system and the video card. Let me reload. I should have better information, or I should, yeah, there we go. So, um, the graphics card that I'm running is supported, but the driver has not been tested, it's telling me. So if you have issues with graphics or with, with uh, unexpected crashing, it's most of the time related to the situation where you're not running a supported card or the driver is out of date. Maybe you're running one that's supported for 2013, but now you're running 20, SolidWorks 2015. Uh, if that's the case, you can get the driver uh, if it does have one that it recommends, you can get that driver through this link. Um, you can also go directly to the the page for video card testing, and I'll show you how that looks uh, for my system. This is a Dell Precision machine, so um, this is the dra the graphics card testing page. You just follow along here. So lots of vendors that they've tested their equipment. So I've got a Dell. Uh, 4500, M4500, and I'm running the 880M in it. And you'll notice uh, it, they have not tested this particular card for 2015. So I'm kind of uh, on my own to get the appropriate driver. But for 14, um, I can go to my operating system and then show the results. And it shows me that this is the appropriate driver for running SolidWorks 2014. 64-bit support, and it passes all the tests for that, and it supports real view graphics. So looking back at, uh, at my RX window, I'm running uh, a newer driver, 9.18, etc. So it's newer than what's recommended for 2014, and it is working fine for my installation. So that's a great way to stay updated with the, the graphics card and make sure you're 
you're getting the most performance out of the out of the card that you're using. One quick comment about that in the system options. Uh, if you go to the performance category here, and if you don't have um, any files open like I do, this uh, this feature here, this checkbox will be available. It's grayed out if you have any files open. But one of the tests that you can use to, to see if the graphics card is the source of the problem is to turn on this option to use software OpenGL. So that allows the software to do the graphics manipulations and takes that away from the, the video card. So if you have crashing issues, you turn this on and you don't have crashing issues, then you've got something going on with the video card and needs to be, uh, be checked further. And this mode can also be activated from within that SOLIDWORKS RX tool. You can have it start SOLIDWORKS in this mode as a test. So for any graphics problems, that's a, a good tool to use there. All right, so uh, I think I've used about all of my time. I wanted to um, open it up if there are any, any questions that you guys might have, anything that I could answer briefly in the little bit, little bit of time that we have. Um, Anything that, um, that you want me to answer, I'll be happy to, to do that now. All right, looks like someone has raised their hand. Russell, uh, if you do have a question, if you, could, if you go ahead and type it in the, uh, type it in the question and answer spot there, please. And I will, in the meantime, try to unmute your phone. Let's see if I can do that. And Russell, yes, I've unmuted it. If you wanted to go ahead and ask your question, that's fine, too. Oh, OK. Um, I was just curious, is there any way to create a drawing through the different configurations? I can create it through drawings. Oh, yes. Um, so when you. Um, create a drawing, if you look at the properties of the view, it will allow you to change the configuration that you're looking at within that. So uh, let me do a, let me create a drawing here real quick. So I'll just throw a view in here and right clicking on the view itself you can go to properties and you can you can tell it which configuration to use in that view. Oh, perfect. Does that answer? Okay, that answers your question. Yeah, so you can make basically you can make multiple drawings from one part. That's correct. And yeah. just switch through the configurations. All right, that's awesome. Right, and each okay. each uh, drawing view can have a different configuration. You know, if you wanted to show a couple of configurations on the same drawing, that's fine too. Okay, cool. Appreciate it. All right. Okay, you bet. Does anyone else have any questions for me? If not, you're free to go. It's uh, all of the content that I had for you guys. Awesome. And all right, thanks a lot. OK, you bet. Looks like Joseph has a question. I'll mute Russell. And uh, Joseph, uh, what's your question for me? Well, I just typed it in, but I was wondering, I noticed when you right clicked on the, uh, the gantry assembly, there was a SolidWorks rename option. Uh, do you know if that manages the links between all the different SOLIDWORKS files, or uh, or is it just like Windows Explorer rename? I've never seen that before, as all. Well. Oh yeah, in the within this right-click menu here, right? Yeah. This rename. Let's go ahead and do it. Let's see. That's the question that you wrote in there. Okay. Yeah, I see it there. Great. Um, Give a minute to get the interface open here. So um, if you notice that we get the ability to update the where use. So this this is the preferred way of doing things. It's it's like what is done within the the uh, SolidWorks Explorer. It uh, it manages the references. So um, any of the files where this is used will reflect the new name. For it. Does that does that answer your question? I think so. Um, is this something new to 2015, or has that been around for a while? Uh, I don't think it's new to 2015, but I don't know how long it's been around, to be honest. Oh. Okay. 
Well, I appreciate it. So I would recommend making sure you test this on a simple assembly and make sure it behaves as you're expecting <laughs> before you do it on a big assembly. <laughs> I'll do that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you for your question. All right, well, I don't see any other hands raised or questions, so I'll, I'll end the presentation at this point. And if you uh, wouldn't mind answering the poll that's at the end of the, uh, the broadcast here, I'd appreciate that. That'll help us get some ideas for uh, whatever we can, whatever you guys are looking for for future webinars. So please take a moment to answer that poll question. Thank you very much for your time and attendance.